Our next speaker is Kate Sargent. Kate drew up in Doreen, just north of Melbourne, but a family ran a farm at Bonnie Doon, where they were a mixed, mixture of undulating steep hill country, running about 1,700 crossbred ewes in 1,000 weathers. After Kate graduated from La Trobe University with a degree in agricultural science, she began work with DPI in 2003 as a livestock industry development officer, specialising in pasture agronomy and grazing management. She's had numerous roles within DPI, been involved with a lot of the DPI programs like Beef Check, Lamb Check, Best Wool, Best Lamb, etc., and very involved with the Evergraze program. And Kate currently holds the positions as the National Evergraze Extension Leader and the Victorian Adoption Manager of the Future Farm Industry CRC. Kate Sargent. Thanks for inviting me along and I think I've got a very tough act to follow after that last presentation. Um, today I thought I would, um, I was asked to talk about rotational grazing um, and uh, I started to think about what I would actually present and thought well grazing management is actually a lot more than rotational grazing. Um, there's a lot of different things that are involved and we have to consider the whole farm system and uh, no farm is the same. So today um, I'm going to draw on a little bit of the Evergraze research as well as some old research from uh, the Broadford Grazing Experiment which is important to refer to in this context um, as well as some case studies uh, from, from this region to talk about what's involved in implementing a grazing strategy and, um, and how, can you, how can you adapt grazing strategies within your own farm system. So what's involved with getting the most out of your pastures with grazing management? Well, every farm is unique and it's also dynamic. We, we live in a very uh, dynamic changing environment when we're farming. So we have to consider what we're given. We're given the climate, the soils and the landscape. We have to consider what's already in place in terms of our management style. If you're going to change then um, obviously if you want to go to the beach in summer, um, then you wouldn't implement a system where you have to move your stock every day. Um, you also have to consider what fencing, soil management, etc. you've already got in place and your enterprise setup. We have to consider how the system can be changed or needs to be changed is probably a better word. Um, so the feed base, fertility, livestock and management. So it's no good trying to set up a grazing strategy that um, is going to run into, a, run into trouble in, uh, in spring because you don't have the right pastures in place. Or uh, potentially it's no good in implementing a grazing strategy if you haven't got your fertiliser right, your soil fertility right, your soil management right, etc. So when you're implementing a grazing strategy, you have to consider um, what other changes strategically you might make in investing in your farm. Grazing management principles um, guide the decisions which affect things like utilisation, so how much we use and how we use it. Um, between seasons, so um, uh, from year to year as well as, as well as within seasons across the whole farm. Um, involves setting up the farm to apply the principles, so dividing up the farm, changes to livestock, changes to pastures, and then there's this concept of compromise. So we have principles as to how we should graze our pastures. We have principles for um, how, how much to leave behind, how much we should graze it down to, what to graze at different times of the year. But what ends up happening is that you have a livestock system to run on that pasture and varying conditions. So you're always going to be compromising between one principle and another. The Evergraze project has looked at this area um, in some detail across six sites across southern Australia, as well as having a look at about 50 or, 50 or more demonstration sites. Particularly in this region, we've actually had uh, about um, 15 demonstration sites uh, that Evergraze has been involved with. So today I'm going to sort of draw on some of the findings, but basically what um, 
what's important to understand is that each of the systems that were implemented in Evergrey's were guided by a set of principles. And as a result of applying those principles, we've managed to increase productivity while at the same time maintaining sustainability of farms. So the primary goal of Evergrey's was to increase productivity um, with a stretch goal of 50%, uh, while at the same time reducing recharge, so water falling below the root zone, and also maintaining ground cover. So each of the sites at Albany in WA, um, Hamilton in southwest Victoria, Wagga, um, or just uh, east of Wagga, in um, north, southern New South Wales, and Holbrook and Chilton, um, and then up to Ta Orange and Tamworth. Each of those sites implemented strategies on a whole farm system and compared the increases in productivity, profitability, and reductions in recharge and, and ground cover, or improvements in ground cover. So the principle that Evergrey has applied was the right combination of plants put in the right place for the right purpose with the right enterprise and with the right management can increase profitability and maintain ground cover and re reduce recharge. The key was that all systems were based on perennials. So because we've actually got perennials in the system, we're able to hit those dual productivity and NR natural resource management targets. Through doing that, we were able to increase profit, reduce risk, improve the natural resource management. The risk element of Evergrey's really emerged uh, after we started with the, with the systems um, about three years in. The profitability target was one thing, but what we started to notice was that by having perennials in the system and also having uh, livestock systems that were flexible, we were actually able to reduce risk. And that became quite important. So in, the t in terms of grazing management, um, one thing that I've really noticed is the main outcome is that the, the management and the implementation of these systems, by applying the principle, we're able to increase control. So having perennials in the system, having them in the right place, having more than one perennial across the farm with, to even out feed supply and demand with summer and winter activity, increased control. We're able to manipulate feed supply and demand. We're able to allocate livestock to appropriate pastures throughout the year to meet productivity targets. We're able to capture and utilise feed quality when it's there, particularly by having summer actives in the system and also by fencing to land class. And we're able to manage pasture composition, persistence and ground cover in targeted areas. One example of the ability to increase control by fencing to production zone was at Orange Evergrey's proof site. So at Orange, it was a native pasture site. So we had um, Warwick Badgery from uh, New South Wales DPI led this project where they fenced, the, um, they fenced the landscape into three zones. The first zone was called the high production zone and it was the valleys, it was about 20% of the site. The second zone was a medium production zone and where the high production zone was dominated by annual ryegrass and microlina, um, those species that actually like the wet conditions, the medium production zone was dominated by wallaby grasses and, and those sorts of species that uh, cope with, with the slightly drier conditions. It was, the slopes were 59% of the area. And then the low production zones on the crests were 21% of the area. Again, sort of the main perennial in that area is, about, is wallaby grass, but it also had um, annual weeds, etc., up in that area. Now, without any differences in fertility history across the, across the site, there were significant differences in fertility between the production zones. So the coal whale phosphorus level was 6.5 on the, on the valley floors, 18.9 on the, uh, the slopes, and then um, 40.7 on the, on the crests. Um, 
I did a little honours project uh, a few years ago, or a few years ago being 10 now, um, <laughs> and um, uh, looked at the distribution of nutrients across the Broadford grazing experiment where we had um, set stocking versus rotational grazing. And that fairly clearly showed that there was a nutrient transfer from the bottom of the paddock to the top, um, probably due simply to the, to the livestock camping at the top of the hill. In this case, um, Warwick thinks that there's actually, because the, the soil tests were not taken in sheep camps, he thinks that it's, this is more to do with the level of productivity difference between the high and the low production zones on this site. So, um, because the low production zone is only producing 3.4 tonnes per annum, it's unlikely that it's utilising the same amount of phosphorus as the high production zone, which is, which is growing 9.9 .9 tonnes per annum. So that's an interesting little finding in itself because you can very simply, divide, by dividing up your farm into these production zones, better allocate fertiliser to, to those different areas. The water accumulation in each of these three areas was 65 mils on the bottom, 55 in the middle and 45 at the top. So um, again, it just sort of backs up why we've got such a difference in uh, productivity between those areas and species. This is just an aerial photography site uh, of that, um, that site. And you can see that um, the green areas where the high production zone is is the most efficient place to put your fertiliser. Um, and in the case of the orange proof site, they had 250 kilos uh, put on in 2002 nine and um, nothing in 2008 or 2011. Okay, so um, in terms of productivity at this site, um, you can see that there's um, the stocking rate is slightly higher in the, um, well I didn't actually tell you what the, <laughs> what the grazing treatments were, but we basically had a difference between a one paddock where all of those production zones were grazed together versus four paddocks um, this is the four paddock system, separated uh, into, those, into those production zones, and then a, one, a 20 paddock system, where it's a more intensive rotation. Um, the difference in productivity between those, in terms of stocking rate, you do get a higher stocking rate from rotationally grazing. And that's consistent with a lot of, a lot of experiments that we've run, Broadford, etc. However, in terms of the lamb produced, you can see there's actually not huge amounts of difference in, uh, in, the, in the lamb produced, and, and the, the four paddock system actually produced less than the one paddock system in, in 2009. And the reason is you do get a slight reduction in the, in the productivity of lamb on a, on a rotational grazing system versus set stocking where they're able to select. Um, but what did happen was that in 2010, the rotations actually produced quite a lot more. And the reason was because um, when they got the good opportunity of the, of the good season in that year, um, where the high production zone needed to be, sorry, the low production zone needed to be de-stocked um, to take them off the hills at the end of spring, the high production or the 20 paddock system and the four paddock system could be all stocked in that higher production zone because it was fenced appropriately. And so lambs were able to be finished. So again, it's about increasing the amount of control by fencing to production zone. You can utilise those high productivity pastures. So in terms of profitability, that was reflected in that 20 paddock system um, in that 2010 year. The second experiment I want to tell you about is a Holbrook. Um, Holbrook is a site where, at Stuart Anderson's property, where we've got um, Phalaris rotationally grazed, um, where in this area, Phalaris is, is definitely the most um, productive, persistent pasture that we've, that we've consistently come across. Um, so it's sort of in this four paddock rotation. Um, and then up in the, up in the hill country, um, we've got native pastures, and that's a pretty common sort of thing that we're all dealing with in this, in this region. The question is whether you can actually run a reproductive enterprise on native pastures 
and uh, therefore increase profitability. And what they did at Holbrook was, um, this is Jim Vagona's work, he had a integrated system where ewes and lambs were rotationally grazed around this four paddock, four paddock system here. And then when the opportunities were right and uh, strategically to manage composition of the native pasture, he put the, the ewes up on the hill country. So one system, one flock rotating around native pasture and phalaris. The other system was a four paddock rotation on the phalaris with ewes and lambs and weathers set stocked up on the hill, which is pretty sort of standard. Now, the important thing to note here is that that native pasture was fertilised. And when you fertilise native pasture, what tends to happen is you get an increase in the annual component. So annual grasses, and annual weeds such as cape weed, and particularly subclover, so subterranean clover. Subclover requires phosphorus fertiliser to grow, and when it does grow, what happens is all of the, uh, you get nitrogen fixed in the soil, and all of the annual pastures that are nitrogen lovers therefore increase in their growth. This is actually an important thing for increasing the production from those pastures. Um, it's not necessarily a negative thing, but the, what, what needs to be considered when you do that is that you have to manage those annual grasses so that they don't overtake the native component. So the theory in this system was that by rotationally grazing a large flock of, of ewes and lambs on the phalaris and then putting that higher stocking rate up into the native pasture in spring, the, um, the native pasture would be able to be managed in terms of its annual component. What happened was that we've got some really, really bad se seasons at the start, we've got some really, really good seasons at the end, and so the, the difference in composition was actually overrun by season, uh, in particular with a very, good, a very good season in 2010. However, um, it was very conclu conclusively found that the ewe lamb system rotating around those native pastures was significantly more profitable than the weathers on the hills and the ewes and lambs on the flats. So that was probably the main finding. So putting this into practice, um, Ian Locke, is Ian here today? I was trying to look out before. He's not. Okay, good. Well, it's not good. But <laughs> um, he won't be able to pick me up. <laughs> um, so... Ian Locke's farm, um, which is Spring Valley in Holbrook, um, he runs cattle and sheep in the one system. And what's really great about Ian's farm is that he's, in history, he's, he's basically run all of his reproductive st stock on this, on this Phalaris high productivity country down on the flats, and then stuck the weathers up on the hills, and they've just sort of made do up there fertilised it and, um, and he's, he's actually lost quite a lot of ground cover over the years and, um, and that system was, in his opinion, not very sustainable. But what he's done in recent years is he's actually taken the weathers, well, got the weathers out of the system and he's only got now ewes and lambs and cows and calves, which he grazes on that, um, the... Phalaris country throughout the, the summer period and then in winter he grazes all of his heifers up on the, the um, hill country and that hill country is um, not fertilised and in his opinion it just keeps the heifers fit and gives them good enough quality feed until calving. When calving comes he brings them all down and he sticks all of the ewes and lambs up into the into that spring pasture, just late in spring, to control the annual component. As a result, this is what it looks like. So the history is the red, in terms of his stocking rate, um, with the weathers on the hills, and now the, um, the green is what his native pastures are stocked with throughout the year. And so, and the, the average is actually higher in terms of the carrying capacity of those pastures, um, and as a result, he thinks he's got significantly increased ground cover, uh, improved the perennial native component, and reduced weed burden and increased overall productivity. So simply by increasing the amount of control, by taking an enterprise out of the system 
and grazing the native pastures at appropriate times, uh, Ian's actually increased his profitability and his productivity as well as the environmental outcomes. It's a really good case study. Um, just bringing it back now to um, the flexibility and options um, setting up the farm system. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about the Wagga proof site, but just one thing to point out was that they in their system had um, a loosen component, which was um, to, to provide summer activity. Now what happened, they had 20% 20, 20 of the farm to loosen versus um, the rest to tall fescue and, and phalaris, and then they also had a 40% in, in the system as well with loosen. The key message out of this was that there was no real difference between the 20% and the 40% in profitability throughout drought years. However, when they got a good year, there was a really significant difference in the profitability where they had loosen in the system because they were able to finish lambs on that system. And so I guess the, the key is that if you do have some ability to put summer activity into your system, if you've got the appropriate soils, Lucerne is a good option to have in there. So compromising to apply the principles. Very briefly, the principles. Um, so everyone's probably seen this slide before in terms of the three leaf stage. Um, basically, if you graze your... If you, perennial ryegrass and phalaris get three leaves and four leaves respectively. So if you graze at the one leaf stage, or when you graze, the carbohydrates in the soil reduce, or in the plant reduce, and then when they get a solar panel, and more solar panels, they increase until they get to about the three leaf stage. So the optimum time to graze is at the three leaf stage for, for ryegrass or four leaves for phalaris. What happens if you graze at the one leaf stage here is that you um, tend to get a, a small root system. If you graze at the three leaf stage, you get a much larger root system because the plant has ability to recover its carbohydrates. The most important time to put this principle into place is autumn, now. And the reason is because this is a phalaris plant, the first leaf that that plant produces is a measly little, little tiny little leaf. Okay? The second is bigger, the third is bigger again, and the fourth is bigger again. If you graze that first autumn leaf, then it's A, going to reduce your uh, winter feed availability, because obviously if you let it get four leaves, it's going to get a lot more feed, and B, it's potentially likely to kill the plant. So if each one takes 10 days to produce, and you keep grazing them, then there's a significantly greater amount of feed uh, potential if you wait compared to if you keep grazing them. Okay. Um, I'm just going to whip through these quickly. So the stocking rate differences, this is the broad for grazing experiment where one was grazed at the three leaf stage, one was grazed set stocking. So because you're actually allowing the plant to get four leaves um, or three leaves, you have an ability to um, you have an ability to increase stocking rate. But the more significant thing out of this experiment was in terms of its composition. So in the Broadford grazing experiment, they significantly increased the or decreased the amount of phalaris in the pasture by set stocking and increased the amount of capeweed and clover in the pasture. And what happened in 2002 when they got a drought was that um, the ground cover levels in those pastures declined to a point where they had to be destocked in spring. And the um, system with the, with, the, with the rotational grazing and high phalaris levels were able to be maintained for six weeks longer than the system with the, um, with the set stocking and cape weed and clover. So the composition levels are important. And this is that site with, with ground cover. So the right hand side is set stocking and the left hand side is rotational grazing. Um, 
So it's important to maintain at least 70% ground cover in the system to maintain your perennials. However, the food on offer um, is also important. So in that system where, um, where the system was grazed down to a minimum of 500 kilos per hectare in the set stock system, the, the amount of phalaris declined rapidly. However, at Orange, where they've also put these set stock systems into place and grazed to 800 kilos per hectare, which is about two centimetres, um, they've actually been able to maintain the native pasture in that system. So that's also important, and it increases the amount of growth that you get if you, if you leave more behind. So in terms of implementing a system, we've talked about the food on offer, we've talked about the um, manipulation in spring of native pastures, we've talked about um, allowing your plants to get three leaves, so there does need to be some kind of compromise because you also need to get, get animal productivity. So throughout the year, you really want to open up the sward for clover at the start to get, to get germination. You want to allow perennials to restore reserves in, in that autumn period. I've put it in red because that's the most important period. If you can't rotationally graze at any other time of the year, at least get them off in autumn. You might be sprayed grazing for broadleafs here. You might be allowing everything to do a little bit hard in, in winter, grazing down to 800 kilos below the targets for, um, for, for livestock, but uh, still above the, the targets for your pastures. Um, because if you don't graze down hard here, then you're going to run into trouble in spring because your stocking rate's probably not high enough. You might be winter cleaning for silvergrass there. Um, grazing hard to allow clovers to branch out in, in, at the start of, the start of uh, spring. That's a really important concept to be able to graze because clovers love close grazing and for every graze they get, the more leaves that they'll produce. And so in early spring, you really want to be grazing that, that clover pasture hard and then uh, ease, ease it back a little bit as they go to seed in, in later spring. You might be spray topping for barley grass and brome there. If you're lambing in spring, you'll be set stocking. You can't keep rotationally grazing through lambing, so there does need to be some sort of compromise there. You might be utilising very hard to um, maximise stocking rate for fodder con conservation in spring. And then you're allocating your high quality paddocks for finishing stock in, in spring. Put as much fat in the back of your ewes and cows as possible in late spring and allow new phalaris pastures to set seed to lay down some dormant buds in, in late spring. So that, that little concept there, a little bit of a, an annual plan for how you might set up your grazing system, there is some level of compromise between each of the principles that you're applying. A good way to get started and stay on top of the monitoring um, is to use the Feed Budget Rotation Planner, which we've got available on the Evergraze website. Um, that steps you through the process of, of doing little feed budgets as well as setting up a rotational grazing system. And to put it all together, I just want to finish um, with a little case study for, for Chris Myrams. Chris, um, Chris was running a, a um, property uh, for the Myers family up in, in Holbrook, um, Wamagama Station, and um, has, has recently gone out consulting. His story is, is a really great one for putting Evergrey's principles into practice. Um, so at Wamagama Station, Chris um, divided up his, that farm um, into essentially production zones. So he's got his native pastures um, in the yellow, which run two to four DSEs per hectare, and um, they're, they're low fertility. And so he's separated all of those off, and he grazes his cows and calves predominantly over that area. Um, the phalaris and subclover in the green is the backbone of his production system. It runs 14 to 20 DSEs per hectare, and Lucerne is in patches where it can grow. 
He's also got some higher fertility native pastures at 6 to 10 DSEs to the hectare. In terms of where he grazes, he's basically rotationally grazing the cows and calves around that low fertility native pasture, which he finds they produce fine on, except for at critical times of the year when, when he needs to meet condition targets. They're down here on some, some Phalaris country, which he's allocated to those stock. The weathers are running around both Phalaris and, um, and high productivity country, they, sorry, and, and low productivity country. They, they require um, some, some input from, from that high fertility at certain times of the year. And the weathers are basically in the system to give him a relief valve. So um, if, if he runs into, into tough times, they're the ones that, that he might let off. The ewes and lambs are basically the same as the Holbrook system, where we've got high fertility native pastures and Phalaris running a single system strategically grazing at certain times of the year. And then in the middle, on his best country, that's where his growing stock are. And so that's sort of a simple way to set up the farm, divide it up for grazing management, and implement rotational grazing, um, appropriately allocating stock to pastures. So to set up your own system, it's important to map the farm, identify your goals and priorities, Develop strategies for enterprises, pastures, soils and land classes and set appropriate stocking rates. Invest in fencing and water infrastructure and manage pasture establishment where it will pay. And develop feed budgets, trigger points, monitor to adapt, adapt to change, allocate mobs to each season to meet requirements and goals and develop rotation plans or grazing charts for each rotation. It might sound a little bit complicated, so um, <laughs> to actually put this sort of thing into place, um, there are programs to support that. Um, Whole Farm Grazing Strategies is a program that we've recent, recently piloted with Evergraze and we're starting a group in this region very shortly. Um, and um, if you're interested, then get in contact with me. Thank you. Simple question. Was there any cons uh, fodder conservation in any of those examples you quoted us, uh, along with the sheep grazing or cattle grazing? Um, definitely at Ian Locke's place and at Chris Myram's place, they both use silage heavily. Um, and um, both of them actually have really good examples of where, um, in good seasons, where they've conser conserved silage and it's significantly reduced the costs of drought. Um, so they actually use big silage pits. They both of them do that, so yes. Good strategy. <laughs>